Thanks for starting your week with us. It's Monday, January 21st here in Korea, and you're tuned in to our midday edition of Arirang News. Hello, I'm Lee Jun in Seoul. Let's get started with a look at what's making the headlines at this hour. We seem to be getting closer to seeing the leaders of North Korea and the U.S. meet again, with officials from the two Koreas and the U.S. meeting in Sweden for roundtable talks. There have been a number of uncertainties on the country's trade front, and the government is meeting with trade-related organizations to discuss ways to help local exporters struggling amid slowing growth and global trade protectionism. South Korea's Ji Eun-hee grabbed a victory at the LPGA's 2019 Diamond Resorts Tournament of Champions on Sunday, winning by two shots over fellow South Korean Lee Mirim. We start over in Sweden as senior officials from North Korea and the U.S. have kicked off working level talks there. They're hoping to make some progress on a second summit between their leaders, which the White House says will take place near the end of next month. Our Kim Hyo-san has more. Working level talks between delegations of North Korea and the United States are being held in Sweden in an effort to prepare for a second Kim Trump summit. North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Choi Son hee and U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began, kicked off their meeting on Saturday local time and haven't appeared in public since. This is their first meeting since Began became Washington's Special Representative for North Korea in August last year. South Korea's nuclear envoy Lee Do-hun has also joined them for three-way talks, which are likely to focus on setting this summit agenda. The three officials are meeting at a highly secured retreat located some 50 kilometers northwest of Stockholm. This comes as Pyongyang's top nuclear envoy Kim Yong-chol arrived in Beijing on Sunday after wrapping up his three-day visit to Washington. He met with President Trump to discuss the details of a second summit and also hand-delivered a personal letter from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Last Friday, when the North Korean official met U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Pompeo said it's time for Pyongyang's denuclearization commitments to be executed and implemented. He revealed his remarks during an interview with Sinclair Broadcast Group as he described the Trump administration's efforts to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Now it's left to be seen whether the talks in Sweden can break the current deadlock over denuclearization talks and lead to a productive second summit. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. So with Pyongyang and Washington preparing for the second summit, one of the questions that many are asking in regards to the talks is the content of the negotiations, which are the denuclearization steps. Our EG1 reports. It is unclear exactly what the high-level officials from North Korea and the U.S. discussed during their high-level talks last week, but one of the items on the agenda was reportedly the freezing of the regime's nuclear assets. Soon after the talks, the New York Times reported, citing officials from several countries briefed on the talks, that the two sides had discussed freezing the North's nuclear fuel and weapons production during negotiations. This is so that the regime's arsenal does not grow while talks drag on. Previously, there have been reports that North Korea is continuing its nuclear weapons program even after the Singapore summit which the U.S. said does not mean the North Korean leader's will to denuclearize has diminished, as there was no agreement on that reached between the two sides yet. Many observers say this is an intermediate stage to the complete denuclearization of North Korea and that the U.S. is taking the phased approach. Freezing the nuclear program used to be the end point of North Korea-U.S. talks before, when the North certainly did not have nuclear material. But with it now claiming that it has nuclear warheads, this freezing would be necessary to get to the end goal to the full dismantlement of Pyongyang's nuclear program. Experts say this would also make it easier for the Trump administration to ease parts of its sanctions on the North for the regime's initial denuclearization steps. Meanwhile, Bloomberg said preparations for Kim Jong-un and President Trump's second summit are taking place in Vietnam. Citing sources familiar with the matter, Bloomberg said that the February summit is likely to take place in Hanoi, the capital of the Southeast Asian country. But it also said that Tanang, site of the 2017 Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting and Ho Chi Minh City in the South, have also been discussed as possible venues. 
More details on the summit and the denuclearization negotiations are to be unveiled after working level talks in Sweden. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. And U.S. President Donald Trump has once again expressed his expectations for his second summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. He took to Twitter on Sunday to say that he looks forward to meeting with Chairman Kim at the end of February. A day earlier, Trump also said that he had a, quote, incredible meeting with the North's nuclear envoy Kim Jong-chul on Friday in Washington. The South Korean Foreign Minister and U.S. State Secretary exchanged views on the recent high-level talks between Pyongyang and Washington during a 90-minute phone call on Monday morning. Seoul's Foreign Ministry said the two diplomats agreed to work closely together so that the North Korean envoy's recent visit to the U.S. can successfully lead to the implementation of the Singapore Joint Declaration. They also discussed their defense cost sharing and promised to come to an agreement soon over the long overdue issue. South Korean Foreign Minister Kang kyung hwa and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo had initially planned to meet in Davos this week, but that plan got scrapped as Pompeo will not be attending the forum there. U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense Randall Shriver has reportedly said that North Korea has a capability to target not only neighboring regions, but also the U.S. mainland. According to Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, the remarks were made during his interview with Japanese daily DSI Shinbun. Shriver also said that last year's suspension of joint military exercises between South Korea and the U.S. following the summit between North Korea and the U.S. last June is related to the diplomatic negotiations. The U.S. forces Japan has revised its controversial YouTube video describing North Korea as a declared nuclear power with over 50 nuclear weapons. It deleted both the depiction of the North as a declared nuclear state and the number of its nuclear arms from the promotional video titled The Mission of U.S. Forces Japan. There were concerns over the video, which was posted about a month ago, that it might negatively affect the ongoing efforts to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and establish permanent peace in Northeast Asia. Amid the longest government shutdown in American history, U.S. President Donald Trump has lashed out at Democrats for rejecting his quote-unquote compromises in exchange for funding his border wall along the Mexican border. Our Noaram has the story. President Trump tweeted he had offered the Democrats what he called compromises over the weekend only to have them rejected before he could even speak about them. These offers included extending temporary protections for young people brought to the United States illegally as children, as well as those fleeing disaster zones. Trump added his opponents, quote, don't see crime and drugs, they only see 2020, which they are not going to win. He still didn't budge on his near $6 billion demand for his border wall with Mexico. The Democrats were quick to dismiss the office, calling them a non-starter and a compilation of several previously rejected initiatives. The Democrats insist they will not negotiate until the government is reopened. In a second tweet, President Trump posted, quote, No, amnesty is not part of my offer. He seemed to be addressing his conservative critics who are concerned the offers he made could amount to an amnesty. He wrote there would be no big push to remove these people, but warned his harshest critic, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, to be, quote, careful. With tensions rising between the White House and the Democrats, there is still no end in sight for the government shutdown, which has now entered its fifth week. No Adam Arirang News. Well, it was a surprising win for South Korean golfer Ji Eun Hee, who grabbed a victory at the first event of this year's LPGA Tour. She came out on top among the 26 golfers who had won LPGA Tour events in the past two seasons. Our Won Jung Hwan tells us more. Veteran South Korean golfer Ji Eun Hee got off to a winning start to the new LPGA Tour season. She won the Diamond Resorts Tournament of Champions in Florida on Sunday by two shots over fellow South Korean Imidim, finishing at 14 under 270 for her fifth career tour win. After becoming champion at the 2009 U.S. Women's Open, Ji went more than eight years without another victory. 
She ended the dry spell in October 2017, picked up a win in March last year, and made history with her win on Sunday, becoming the oldest South Korean to win an LPGA Tour event. At 32 years, 8 months, and 7 days old, Ji, who previously said she will retire at 30, is now the oldest South Korean LPGA Tour winner. The record was previously held by Park Seri, who won the 2010 Bell Miko LPGA Classic at the age of 32 years, 7 months, and 18 days. With Ji's perfect start to the season, South Korean golfers this year are looking to go one better than their combined 9 victories in 32 tournaments last season. The tour will resume early next month with the ISPS Handa Vic Open in Australia. Wonjawan, Arirang News. Further cementing his legendary status in Vietnam, the country's head coach Park Kang Sa stunned the football world again by beating Jordan on penalties to advance to the quarterfinals of the 2019 Asian Cup in the UAE. After 90 minutes of regular play and half an hour of extra time, the match was tied at 1-1. Vietnam's goalkeeper was the hero, helping the team to a 4-2 penalty shootout win. Fox team will be playing the winner from tonight's match between Japan and Saudi Arabia. Korea's Trade Ministry and the Korea International Trade Association met today to discuss ways to support local exporters. Trade Minister Song Yung Mo sat down with trade-related organizations and company representatives and promised to hold these meetings every quarter to listen to their difficulties. Song said the government will keep working with the private sector because slower trade growth and semiconductor market conditions are negatively affecting local exporters. They discussed some specific measures as well during the meeting, such as expanding support for trade insurance provided by Korea Trade Insurance Corporation. The competitive global market for mobile phones, especially with China flexing its muscle in the sector, have led Korea's smartphone exports to slump to its lowest level in more than a decade and a half. Our Lee sing reports. South Korea's tech giants continue to provide consumers with the latest and most powerful smartphone technology, a necessary measure to stay ahead of the game in the cutthroat mobile market. In November, Samsung Electronics unveiled its first foldable phone that can be used as a smartphone and a tablet. But despite the company's technological advances and focus on innovation, the Ministry of Science and ICT says South Korea's mobile phone exports slumped to a 16-year low of 14.6 billion U.S. dollars in 2018, down more than 23 percent from the year before. Experts say the slump could be due to the general slowdown of the global smartphone market and an increase in overseas production and parts procurement. Last year, global smartphone shipments topped out at 1.44 billion units, down 5 percent from a year ago. South Korea's market share also dipped in overseas markets. While it improved slightly from 2017 to the first quarter of last year, it has since decreased. Experts point to increased competition by Chinese companies like Huawei and Xiaomi. Global smartphone demand drops last year due to a lack of innovation. Demand is unlikely to increase this year as the general situation is not good and competition will only intensify. With a narrowing technology gap with China, local experts say developing innovative smartphones based on 5G technology and strengthening related ventures in R&D will positively affect demand for South Korean smartphones in the future. Lee seung Arirang News. We're living in an ever more smart world than before, and with hopes of getting ahead of the game, the South Korean government plans to invest more in developing the so-called voluntary cooperation technology between robots and drones. Our Hong Yu has the details. Today's technology allows robots and drones to embark on rescue missions to places that cannot be reached by people or to remote areas that would take rescuers too long to reach by conventional measures. On Sunday, South Korea's Ministry of Science and ICT said it's aiming to develop robots and drones capable of sharing information in real time to increase the chance of them successfully carrying out their mission. 
The new technology will allow an unmanned vehicle to detect, communicate, and make decisions by itself. They hope the funding will help South Korea secure a leading global position in the unmanned vehicle market. More than half of the investment, around three and a half million U.S. dollars, is to be set aside for the development of traffic management and monitoring technology that can be attached on drones that fly at low altitudes. These drones will be able to navigate to destinations even when the weather is bad. This year, the minister will focus on ensuring newly developed unmanned vehicles can be commercialized instead of limiting their use to the public sector. Officials hope private sector involvement will ensure continual development of the technology. But ministry officials say their plans will need to be given the all-clear by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, as well as the Ministry of National Defense. Hong Yu, Arirang News. The South Korean government has revealed it's going to decommission several coal-fired power plants over the next few years as part of efforts to counter the country's chronic issue with fine dust. The trade ministry says 10 coal plants nationwide will be closed permanently by 2022. That's three years earlier than the previous deadline of 2025. The government will also prevent coal plants that have been operational for more than 30 years from operating between March and June of this year. Other measures include boosting investment for environmental facilities and encouraging energy companies to build gas-powered fired power plants. What happens to medical costs and income when a middle-aged man or woman suddenly becomes ill? Our Kim Hesong explains. A report shows that when middle-aged people fall sick and are hospitalized for more than three days, their medical expenses go up by an average of 780 U.S. dollars a year, while their income drops by around $5,330. Using the Korea Health Panel's data between 2008 and 2015, the Korea Development Institute compared 269 people aged between 40 and 55 who are suddenly hospitalized to 871 people from the same age group with no health problems. The KDI report defined suddenly falling ill as those with no previous experience of hospitalization in the last two years suddenly being hospitalized for more than three days. Pregnant women and people with chronic diseases were excluded. The findings show the income of those who suddenly fell sick dropped 24 percent compared to the other control group in the first year and 42 percent the following year. More than 10 percent lost their full-time jobs the year they fell sick. Annual medical expenditures went up more than three-fold, but after three years there was not much difference in medical expenses between those who had been hospitalized and those with no health problems. The KDI report said this shows the income loss resulting from a sudden illness far outweighs the medical cost burden. Citing the growing elderly population, the KDI said coming up with a job policy to help the middle-aged to find work again after recovering from illness is important. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. Three more measles cases were reported over the weekend in Ansan, south of Seoul, following five confirmed cases there last week. The newly infected were found to be the parents of the five infants who contracted the disease. Similar cases were also reported in other parts of the country, including Daegu and Gyeongsangbuk-do province. Health authorities have launched an emergency response system and asked people to pay extra attention to their health. Meanwhile, one more newborn baby on Jeju Island was confirmed to have respiratory syncytial virus, which can cause pneumonia and other respiratory illnesses amid a series of cases reported in the country recently. Last week, the South Korean Navy Sea Salvage and Rescue Unit conducted its annual winter training. By plunging into the freezing sea, the special unit showed its members are willing and ready for any mission on the open waters. Our Kan Young-woo has more. Around 100 members of the Navy's Sea Salvage and Rescue Unit warm up with some light jogging and stretching. They're preparing for what's to come a plunge into the bitterly cold sea with only a pair of shorts on. Part of their annual five-day winter training, the special unit made the jump last Thursday into waters off the naval military port in Chine, Gyeongsangnam-do province. I felt like my hands and feet were about to fall off when I plunged into the sea, but I was able to overcome the challenge and gain some confidence from my unit as we endured it together. 
The special unit's winter training also included rubber boat paddling and a search and rescue mission from a maritime helicopter. This year's program focused on adapting the unit's members to extremely cold sea temperatures and preparing them for any challenges they may face on the high seas. This year's training is about making sure SSU divers are ready to complete their duties under any circumstances. We'll continue to put the utmost effort into protecting the lives of the people and keeping our seas safe. As one of the South Korean Navy's special forces along with the UDT SEAL, the ship salvage and rescue unit is well known for its intense and months-long training period which demands both physical and mental excellence. Their missions normally include ship salvaging, search and rescue, removing obstacles from harbors or other waterways, and the reconnaissance of enemy vessels. Kan Yong-ho, Arirang News. Now, many politicians these days use Twitter or Facebook to spread their message to the public. But now a growing number of political figures here in Korea are using YouTube to promote themselves. And with some enjoying huge success, more are jumping on the bandwagon. But this does come with some downsides as well. Our Kim min explains. YouTube has become a must for political figures in South Korea thanks to the video platform's potential to reach a huge audience and as a means to get their ideas out unfiltered. Topping the list with the most subscribers is Yoo Shin Min, a former liberal politician. Since he started uploading videos in early January, the YouTube channel he appears on has seen an over threefold increase in subscribers and now is over 630,000. His videos are aimed at helping viewers get background information on the government's policies. Among conservatives, the rising YouTube star is Hong Jun-pyo, former chief of the main opposition Liberty Korea Party. Although he lags behind Yu in terms of subscribers with around 240,000, he has seen that figure steadily crime, garnering attention for his stinging criticisms of the current government. But those two aren't the only Korean politicians with a YouTube presence. From individual lawmakers to political parties as a whole, all of them have been stepping up their online activity and changing with the times. Not all politicians are widely known, so YouTube gives them a platform to reach an untold number of people. Although not all of them will become popular, you're seen as an outsider if you don't have your own channel. A politician's lifespan in a sense depends on how much voters know about them, so YouTube is a great tool. While it's a way to get publicity, some say it's a double-edged sword. There's the issue of fake news with politicians making remarks based on unidentified sources or that are altogether false, as there's no gatekeeping on YouTube. And on the viewers' part, they will likely watch only content produced by politicians they like, stoking concerns of ideological bias. YouTube is different from traditional media, meaning it's not regulated by existing laws. Therefore, even if the content is based on fake news, it won't be subject to criminal punishment. Sensitive information might help drive its popularity now, but it could sow distrust down the line and politics could end up tainting YouTube. What's for sure is that the YouTube craze is here to stay, especially ahead of the 2020 general elections. But experts advise politicians to be responsible about what they say, especially in regards to their opponents, and for viewers to consume traditional media as well, so that they can get balanced information. Kim Minji, Arirang News. Good afternoon. We had a freezing and windy start to the new week with a cold wave advisory. And colder parts of the country saw lows plunging to below minus 10 degrees Celsius. But highs will rise rapidly by nearly 20 degrees by the afternoon to hover around the mid-single digits. And central parts of the country will see more clouds through the mid-afternoon with a slight chance of snow flurries including here in Seoul. Meanwhile, Tokyo and Beijing both will be under plenty of sunshine along with mild temperatures. And back to today's temperatures in Korea. Colder temperatures are a lot more welcome these days as we tend to see cleaner air. 
and daily highs will range between 5 and 9 degrees Celsius this afternoon. You know, it's supposed to be the coldest time of the season here in Korea, but we'll actually see quite bearable temperatures for another week or so. Well, colder morning lows are in the forecast for the latter half of the week, but it shouldn't be too bad. But it could also get drier and possibly dustier. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world. And that's all the news we have for now, but we'll be back at 4 p.m. with more, so don't forget to tune in then. Until next time, goodbye.